Bohemians, Gypsies, Gitanos, Zigan, Rom, Roma, Romani, who are they? And this talk is going about dispelling the myth, looking at the art and the representation, and looking at the reality. The best image I could find to really understand the difference between the gypsies and the so-called civilians is this image of a domesticated dog with a collar looking at nature through the window and the free wolf and the river, no color. The domesticated dog has his croquettes, his food is all ready for him, and the wild dog has got to hunt for his food. It doesn't need any words. Houses, buildings, and la roulotte, the caravan, the old ones, the new ones, on wheels, so you can move, so you're not sedentary, because this is what it's about. Sedentarization versus nomadism. Domestication versus wild, natural. Freedom, no identity papers. Is it still possible? No, we are too many. This is what they say. Les gens du voyage, the people of the travel, a hard life for freedom. Gypsies have been dehistorified. Travelers, fortune tellers, students and artists, who are the Bohemians? Here you have a few representations. Courbet, l'atelier du peintre, the artist living in the Bohemia. Caravaggio, do you using the stereotype of the fortune teller. And les Bohemians du voyage. The name Bohemian refers to nomadic outcasts living in Bohemia a region of the Czech Republic. Bohemians were associated with unorthodox, anti-establishment, political and social viewpoints, which often were expressed through free love, frugality, and in some cases, voluntary poverty. Bohemianism describes a thirst for freedom expressed in the non-traditional lifestyles of marginalized, out of the grid, and impoverished artists, writers, journalists, musicians, and actors. And here you have Le Chat Noir, which was a, the hangout of the Bohemia in Paris in Montmartre in the late 19th century, and a Toulouse-Lautrec representation of the bourgeois <laughs> elbowing a little bit the Bohemian life. There is a semantic maze that I will try to clarify for you. The name Gypsy is an erroneous name derived from Egyptian, created from the belief that these nomadic people came from Egypt, Egyptian, Gypsian, Gypsy. But now, we know Gypsies migrated around 1,000 years of this common era from northwestern India as evidenced by their language, which is similar to Sanskrit. At the Chicago World Fair of 1893, the gypsy Egyptian dancers were an attraction. The dark coppery skin, black hair, and exotic clothing led people to believe that they were from Egypt. The ancestors of modern-day gypsies were previously Hindu, but adopted Christianity or Islam, depending on their respective countries due to missionary activities. So, gypsies originated in India, where they worked as musicians, entertainers, 
and metal workers. They were discriminated against and excluded from the temples. Later, they were sent to Persia as minstrels. From Persia, they were separated into two groups. One traveled northward and became the Romani-speaking European Gypsies, and the other traveled southward and became known as the Domari or Middle Eastern Gypsies. The generic usage of the name Gypsy referred to any itinerant person or person suspected of dishonest practice. This generic use derives from racist stereotypes of the Rom people. The word gypsy is actually considered offensive by many Romani. In this engraving of the 16th century, you can see l'Egyptienne, l'Egyptien, and uh, showing them with a uh, long coat and a big shawl and a flat hat. And we shall come back to that. The Gypsies arrived in Europe during the late 15th and early 16th century. They were descended from an ancient warrior class from India. They migrated through Persia, Iran, Turkey, Armenia, and eventually to Europe. Today, there are some 15 million Gypsies, mainly in Europe, France, Romania, Hungary, Bulgaria, Spain, but also in the Americas. Like many other migrant ethnic groups, they faced discrimination, including folk tales mothers used to scare their children. If you do not behave, the gypsy will take you away. 500 years of slavery in Romania, only to be emancipated in 1851, extermination in Nazi Germany, and ethnic cleansing in Kosovo, quite recently, in 1998-1999. And here is a proof of the auction of a Romani slave in Bucharest in 1852. Kosovo. No comment. Values such as justice, fidelity, and morality are very significant in Rome societies. Courtesy, hospitality, and friendliness are very important. The control of deviance is strictly enforced if a Rome becomes impure by some immoral or unlawful act, he is considered an outcast. Also, sexual purity is considered a must for young girls. In fact, like in Hasidic culture, it must be proven that a girl has never been with a man. This strict social code is related to their old Hindu caste system, which they have kept since their origin. That being said, they are of course, like in any other culture, the bad apples, gangs, criminals and pickpockets, but they are everywhere. They are not only wrong, and they should not be stereotyped. This is a Rome gang in the Czech Republic. Gypsies in Mexico. There are 51,000 Mexican Roma gypsies called Romo Ungaros because they mostly came from Hungary. And in 1970, the 5 peso banknote represented a Roma woman. Mexican gypsies also descend from Spanish gitanos. The Catemaco gypsies have the reputation of being brujas, witches. Here they are in Veracruz. Oaxaca-born Rome, Señor Mandes, 58 years old, descendant of Northern India and European ancestors who came to Mexico in the 19th century. This is what he says. We are like sailors accustomed to the sea and sky. I was born this way, so I don't miss things like a house or air conditioning. 
Sometimes life can be hard. The rain leaks in our tents and it's cold. But I am the duel, the master of my tent, my truck and my family. I have my freedom, like in Esope fable of the wolf and the house dog. Mexico gypsies speak a language they call Cal or Spanish Romani. Gitans and Gitanos, a game from a Gitano, are also known as flamencos, French and Spanish for gypsies. For the Gitanos, the significance of their singing is not related to the musical sophistication, but to the extent in the way the singer can strike or touch the audience through a kind of primitive rough rocker style, the flamenco style, with Andalusian, Moorish, Jewish, Sephardic, Byzantine and Indian influences. The flamenco fiesta is called La Huerta. Flamenco gypsy singing is a means of empathic transfer, not an aesthetic goal in itself. Since the traditional gypsy have no interest in writing, their songs were their only tools to orally pass on historical facts, but also their personal feelings and emotions. Flamenco, flamingo, flame. It includes the cante, the singing, the toque, the guitar playing, the baile, the dance and the palmas. And here is the flame, the flamingo and the flamenco dancer. The words manouche and romanichelle, as a Parisian slang for gypsies, is a corruption of romani chave, which means gypsy lads. Manouche comes from manouchian, which means people in Hindi. Romanichelle derives from the romani romani sel, which means a group of people. They call themselves human beings, people. The word Tsigan, Russian Tsigan for gypsy, comes from the Greek word at Tsiganos, untouchable. Tsigan with a Z or Tsigan with an S. It gave Zeigener in German, Tsigani in Hungarian, Zingaro in Italian, and in French you can write Tsigan with an S or Tsigan with a Z. Today, the Tsigan people prefer the S to the Z because the latter reminds them too painfully of the Z for Zeigener tattooed by the SS in the concentration camps. Also, the Z does not correspond to the pronunciation of the word Tsigan, not Tsigan. Zingara, gypsy in Italian, most likely from the same Greek term meaning untouchable. The modern Greek designation is Tsiganoi. And we have Operetta and Opera La Zingara de Donizetti. Verdi also wrote a song, La Zingara, because it's exotic. La Zingarella, that's a marble and bronze by Cordier. A la Zingara, in French cuisine, a la Zingara means gypsy style sauce. It's a garnish consisting of chopped ham, tongue, mushrooms and truffles, combined with tomato sauce, tarragon and sometimes Madeira wine. And this garnish is served with meat, poultry, pasta and eggs. The words Rom and Roma 
the most original, truthful, all-inclusive ethnic name. The Roma brought the name from India in a phonetic modification of the ethnic caste term Rum, meaning human being, again. And here photos of Roma gypsies in Canada and Roma gypsies in Italy. Although today Roma living in various lands around the world use different autonima for the societies, Sinti, Kail, Manush, all acknowledge a common origin and basic identity with the Roma. The Rome tribes distinguish themselves by their trades. Lautari are musicians and dancers. Calgadari, Calderash, tin and coppersmith. Argintari, the jewelers, they work with plate, silver, plata. Zlateri, the gold panners. Ferrari, the blacksmith. E Gurara, their sieve makers. And here is a beautiful image of the legendary gypsy stallion. The Romani language. Sae manushikane structure bijenjona tromaneta cecune do de vinci jaka pipa. Translation. All human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights. They are endowed with reason and conscience and should act towards one another in a spirit of brotherhood. The Irish and Scottish versions of the gypsy, the travelers, they are called the tinkers. A tinker was originally an itinerant tinsmith who mended household utensils. Here are photos of Scottish and Irish thinkers. There are about 25,000 of them today, Irish thinkers. Many Irish thinkers left Ireland during the Great Famine of 1845-1860. And where did they go? They went to the USA. So we have American gypsies and travelers. Earlier representations, the arrival of gypsies outside Bern in 1485. Leonardo da Vinci, a man tricked by gypsies in the grotesque style, the stereotype of the gypsy being a thief, is going to go full blown. Titian, here is a gypsy Madonna. The Madonna doesn't have blonde hair, she has dark hair, and she has a cloth, and she covers her hair. Boccaccio Boccaccinino, a young gypsy girl, melancholic, eyes filled with sky, an oriental turban knotted around her neck, and a red blanket on her right shoulder. Hans Buchmeier, Gypsies at the market, if you look well, they are depicted as stealing. And in the ceramic plate, they are depicted as a fortune teller. The fortune teller cliché, a tapestry from the 16th century, basil fortune tellers. Can you see them? Paul Brill, fantastic landscape with gypsies. Now here is the depiction of nature in harmony with those people, people living in, within nature. Campo Vaccino with fortune teller, again. The fortune teller. Notice that the white aristocratic young woman there is a fortune teller looking like a hag in front of her and somebody behind her trying to steal from her. The cliché goes on and on. Moses saved from the waters. Moses is wrapped in a blanket with stripes, red and white. 
we're going to see those stripes again and again. And notice in the painting the flat hat that we already saw in the depiction of l'Egyptienne et l'Egyptien. A little digression. The gypsy hat in religious paintings it's called the flat galette, a galetta, enveloped with material called berne. The cloak and the red. So, Jan van der Vene, Bohemian encampments. You can see again the flat galette hat, the red coat, and living in frugality. Here, gypsies and actors, and again, the flat hat, and one is trying to steal something from the pocket. The cliché goes on. Caravaggio, the fortune teller. Another fortune teller, and look at the hands. And look at the eyes. And again, the oriental turban, not a flat galette this time, and the blanket with a red stripe. Gypsies in the forest, that's where they like to live. Away from the city. Georges de Latour, the fortune teller, again. So you can see that the fortune teller looks like a hag. And then there's somebody on the other side trying to steal from the pocket. The stripes are more ornate, but it's still stripes and red and an oriental turban. The cheat, Georges de la Tour. So here depicting the gypsy the Rome as a cheater. A couple in an interior with a fortune teller and again bourgeois couple and the gypsy fortune teller looks like a hag with a very coppery skin. The blanket is not red but it's striped. Another fortune teller Again, the hag-looking fortune teller. Jacques Callot is engravings of gypsy encampments and two beggars, because the gypsies, the Rome, are also depicted as beggars. Another fortune teller coppery skin, but this time she's younger. But if you can see on the side of the gentleman who has his hand uh, red, there is a dark hand trying to steal from his pocket. Again, fortune telling, thieving. The Zingara costume. There's a Zingara woman, difficult to pronounce. Archihara Zingana, where you have the turban, you have the red, and you have the shawl. The fortune teller, again, I'm, sh I'm showing you all those images to see how artists, commissioned or not, have propagated the stereotype of the Rome people as bad people, thieves, cheaters, Another fortune teller. Another fortune teller. It goes on and on and on for centuries. Now, with France Hals, we have here La Bohemienne, and there is no stereotyping. She is jolly. She doesn't have a dark coppery skin. She doesn't look like a hag. She has the red garment, but nothing on her hair, just loose hair. The more you comb your hair, 
the less free you are. So, gypsy hair, free hair. The nuptial gypsy banquet, having fun, singing, dancing, drinking. And notice in this composition by Watteau, a Rococo painter from France, the composition which separates the two worlds. On one side, you have the three aristocratic, white-skinned, impeccable young woman. And on the other side, in the fresh air, you have the fortune teller looking like a hag with a dog without color. A free dog. Gainsborough was the first English painter to have been interested in painting Bohemians. Here they are represented in nature, with a campfire. The fortune teller, 18th century, the cliché goes on. And then it became a fashion for the ladies of the aristocracy to get very exotic and out of the grid by uh, Louise Elisabeth Vigée Lebrun, 18th century, 19th century, dancer with tambourine and portrait of Lady Hamilton as a gypsy with a tambourine. Loosen hair and the tambourine. Very important, the tambourine. We're going to go back to that. Goya! Alors là, we have the Gitanos in Andalusia and La Maja Vestida, Maja Desnuda. Majos and Majas mean really lower class people and also women of little virtue. The Western phobia of vagabondage. Beggars and gypsies are untamed. Their itinerant way of life disturbs and scares because civilization means sedentarization. And here you have Ordonnance du Roi et Déclaration du Roi that says that all those people, the vagabonds, the mendiants, the, the beggars, they have to be out of the city, like a ghetto. In the 19th century, something happens. It's, I call it the romantic, romanticization of Bohemia, the cult of la vie de Bohème. Poor artists in love, looking at the sky, living in frugality. And of course, Victor Hugo romanticized the gypsy with Esmeralda in Notre Dame de Paris. And here she's represented with a goat and a tambourine. And she's Esmeralda taking care of Casimodo. Remember, take care of your brothers. Another Esmeralda, a bit more sensuous with a goat. It is not unlike uh, that uh, in India, you can still uh, see today, I've, I've seen it myself, that some Indian women belonging to the, to the Roma, they actually suckle monkeys with their breasts. And here she's almost suckling the goat. The animal world and the human world weld together. The Hunchback of Notre Dame became a movie. Antoni Quinn, Ginarolo Brigida, romanticizing the gypsy. Well, it's better than the cliché. The stamp was made and then Walt Disney. And notice again this tambourine. What is the gypsy tambourine? It has small metal jingles called zils. The tambourine can be traced back to most ancient civilizations such as India, Persia, Greece, China, Egypt, and Rome. It is also the instrument on which Miriam played after the Israelites escaped from Egypt. Often associated with joy, dancing, rejoicing, victory, and times of happiness and gladness. The word tambourine comes from the French tambourin, a long narrow drum used in Provence, diminutive of tambour, and it's rooted in the Arabic tumbur and the Middle Persian word 
tambour. And here is a painting of a gypsy with tambourine. The origins of gypsy dancing from the Kalbela dancers in India. And something very important here is the tribanga or tribunga. It's a tri-bent pose, neck, waist, knee, standing position or stance used in traditional Indian sculpture, as you can see in the Shiva Kalya Satsundara, sustainer of those hearts filled with great love. To project a gentle S shape, considered the most graceful and sensual. So the gypsy dancing originated in the Tribanga of India. A Banjara Indian gypsy dancer with, juxtaposed to it, the Middle, Middle Eastern belly dancers. Turkish gypsy dancers, flamenco dancers, Romani gypsy dancers from Russia, they all have the Indian tribanga, the S sensual shape that allows you to move in and out of everything, freedom again. In Rajasthan, a gypsy dancer in Pushkar, India, a Spanish gypsy dancing, a Romanian gypsy dancing, all the same. Prosper Mérimée, a French writer, wrote his very famous novel called Carmen. And of course, Carmen became an opera by Georges Bizet. Edouard Manet, painting Emily André, who played the role of Carmen, and the most famous of all, Maria Callas, the Carmen. The Habanera song, love is a rebellious bird that nobody can tame, and you call him quite in vain if it suits you not to come. Love is a gypsy child. It has never ever known a law. Love me not, then I love you, and if I love you, you best beware. Now, the Habanera song is very interesting. Literally, it means from Havana, the name used outside of Cuba for the Cuban Contradanza, a popular dance music in the 19th century, including African rhythms and the first dance music from Cuba to be exported all over the world. Bizet Carmen is the first Western music to include rhythmically based African motif. That is why the song of Carmen, Love Me, Love Me Not, is called La Habanera. And it's not far removed from flamenco. For Nietzsche, La Gitane, whose apotheosis is Bizet's Carmen, is the fatal embodiment of Mediterranean passions, superior to the frigid spirits of Richard Wagner's novel's mists. Here is a zingara with tambourine, but extremely melancholic. There's no red, it's a pastel pink. She doesn't play the tambourine. She is sad. Something is happening, losing identity maybe. Here she's depicted as a seductress. Another seductress, the gypsy oriental beauty, with the turban and the tzils. Oriental gypsy odalisque. The French word Odalisk originates from the Turkish odalik, meaning chambermaid, from oda, chamber or room, and also a concubine and a courtesan. 
Usually the odalisques are represented horizontal on their bed, and in the 19th century, the courtesans were called les horizontales, the horizontals. <laughs> Charles Landel, young Bohemian, Bohemian girls, Jewish woman from Tangier. We have here the beginning of a juxtaposition and melding of the gypsy spirit and the Jewish spirit, both being discriminated. Art et liberté. Here is a Bohemian violinist. And some tzikan, having fun listening to music and free love and showing their breasts. But there is nothing offensive here. Three Bohemians in the campo. No stereotype of thieving or fortune telling or cheating. They are playing music, the violin. The wish. Now here is another fortune teller and this uh, gypsy Roma woman telling the cards. Beware because she might tell you things that you don't want to hear. But she's a seductress as well. The fortune teller with a swarthy gypsy with black cat, like a witch. Victorian representations. Now, now it becomes entertainment. You go to the fairs and you go and see the freaks, you go and go and see the, the monsters, and you go and see the Romani Rai and the gypsies, the Roma. For Gustave Courbet, Bohemianism meant freedom. He was himself a Bohemian. In this painting, he's represented walking with a backpack, a long beard and a dog without uh, any uh, sort of domestication and meeting to uh, civilians on the road, on the road, always be on the road. His self-portraits are very telling. There's pride, and there is passion, and there is a rebellion as well against the system. Here, Bohemian and her children, still by Gustave Courbet, a realistic representation. There is no seduction here, no fortune telling, no dancing, but on the road. It's hard to be on the road. In this representation by Renoir, impressionist, famous uh, French painter, La Bohemienne, long disheveled hair, the stripes are here, loosen, but nostalgia in her eyes. Maybe she doesn't belong. Baudelaire, one of the cursed poets of the 19th century in France, the urban nomad. He actually had himself put in a cell, in a prison, to be able to be away from the noise of civilization so he could write. I translated that for you. Bohemia en voyage, gypsies on the road. They set out yesterday the tribe of ragged seers with burning eyes, burying their little ones in nests upon their backs, or giving them, to stop their tears, the teeth of inexhaustible and swarthy breasts. The men walk, shouldering their rifles silently, beside the hooded wagons and bright tatters hung, and peer into the sky, as if they hoped to see some old mirage that beckoned them when they were young. Van Gogh, Les Roulottes, the Caravans. No matter where they journey through the meager land, the cricket will sing louder from this layer of sand, and Sibylle, who loves them, will smile where they advance. The desert will be fruitful, 
The arid rock will flow before the footsteps of these wayfarers who go eternally into the lightness realm of chance. Magnificent. In his private diary, my heart led there, and mon cœur mis à nu, Baudelaire writes, To glorify vagabondage is what we can call bohemianism, the cult of multiple sensations. In music, see Liszt. Liszt, the Hungarian virtuoso pianist, acknowledged his immense debt to the strong emotional content of gypsy music. Arthur Rimbaud, another cursed poet of 19th century France, he was called le poète au semelles de vent, the poet with souls of wind. Ma Bohème, he wrote that at the age of 16. I went off with my hands in my torn coat pockets. My overcoat too was becoming ideal. I traveled beneath the sky, muse, and I was your vessel. Oh dear me, what marvelous loves I dreamt of. My only pair of breeches had a big hole in them. Stargazing, thumb thumb, I sewed rhymes along my way. My tavern was at the sign of the great bear. My stars in the sky rustled softly. And I listened to them, sitting on the roadsides, on mm. those pleasant September evenings, while I felt drops of dew on my forehead, like vigorous wine. And while rhyming among the fantastical shadows, I plucked, like the strings of a lyre, the elastics of my tattered shoes, one foot close to my heart. La vie de Bohème. Henri Murger, Murger wrote his Scène de la vie de Bohème from his own experiences as a desperately poor writer living in a Parisian attic. Murger was a member of a loose club of friends who called themselves the water drinkers because they were too poor to afford wine. Scène de la vie de Bohème. Bohemia is a stage in artistic life. It is the preface to the Academy, the Hôtel Dieu, or the Morgue. Today, as of old, every man who enters on an artistic career without any other means of livelihood than his art itself will be forced to walk in the path of Bohemia. Puccini Opera, La Bohème. The world premiere performance of La Bohème was in Turino in February 1896 and conducted by the young Arturo Toscanini. The attic, the poor artists, frugality and love, vivre d'amour et d'eau fraîche, to live from love and fresh water. La vie de Bohème, la vie d'artiste. In this caricature by Daumier, it says, wood is dear and art doesn't sell. I've been there. Best moments in my life. Honoré de Balzac, le prince de Bohème. This word Bohème is self-explanatory. Bohemia possesses nothing, yet contrives to exist on that nothing. Its religion is hope, it's called faith in itself, its income, insofar that it appears to have one, charity. Emile Zola, Nana, La Bohème Na includes all the cocotte and semi-mondaine, the courtesans, and the queen of La Bohème is La Vérole. La Vérole is a venereal disease. Huh? Nana will die of this venereal disease, like syphilis. Zola, l'œuvre, the masterpiece. 
the tragic story of Claude Lantier, an ambitious and talented young artist who has come from the province to conquer Paris. It contains unromanticized accounts of La Vie de Bohème. Zola stresses the illusions and disillusions of this way of life, poverty, hunger, cold, and drinking. L'Absinthe by Degas, Getting Drunk by Lautrec, and The Lone Drinker by Lautrec. That's the portrait of his friend, Jeanne Vence, as the vulnerable femme de brasserie, the waitress. The dark and moody palette evokes the tragic nature of this subject. Lautrec in his studio, La Vie d'Artiste, he left the aristocratic castle, the aristocratic de Lautrec family, and he went to Montmartre and he lived poor. He didn't accept money, but he had some and he helped others. And the best time he ever had was living with the prostitutes who were the only kind woman who didn't make fun of him because he was handicapped. That's another story, but he was an abo, he was uh, his legs after a, a fall didn't, didn't grow. And he drank a lot. Madeleine, still drinking, and Le Lapin Gilles, Le Lapin Gilles was another haunt of the Bohemia in those days. In 1875, the artist André Gilles painted the sign that was to suggest its permanent name, Le Lapin Agile, that means the conejo, the rabbit that belonged to Gilles, and then it became the Agile Rabbit. 1880, Le Lapin Gilles. We need haunts like that, they don't exist anymore. Interieur d'atelier. The artist, being cold, but still drawing. The artistic life in the attic again. And to keep warm, you have le poil. So here you have no, no human beings, but just le poil. In this poil, you could put bars of chairs, a paper, whatever, just to keep warm, and sometimes even the stretchers of your canvas. The 20th century. In the 1932 Dictionnaire de l'Académie Française, it describes the bohemian way of life as one who lives a vagabond, unregimented life without assured resources, who does not worry about tomorrow. Kiss van Dongen, la gitane. Loosen hair, the shawl. Modigliani, he was called the last Bohemian prince. And here is his depiction of the gypsy woman in 1919. And all that's left from the cliche representation is a little color striped with red. Picasso, au lapin Gilles, and the absent drinker. Drinking and actors and playing the guitar. And here we have the drinking, uh, <laughs> the drinking to forget. Van Gogh and Picasso with the absinthe, from the Green Fairy, as the absinthe was called, to the blues. The Absinthe Drinker by Picasso, with the feverish hands and the red shawl. Tamara de Lampica, a Polish art deco painter, and she decided to go back to the cliche of the fortune teller. But my God, she depicts her like she's uh, about to kill somebody, no? So, uh, Tamara de Lampica, I'm not so sure. Otto Müller, he was born in German Silesia. His nickname was Gypsy Müller because he loved painting gypsies and also because his mother was thought to be Romani. This is a gypsy camp with goat in nature. 
a gypsy encampment. Zebener mit Sonnenblumen, a gypsy with sunflowers, then a gypsy mother and daughter. And you find the show, the red, the stripes, but they're very sad. They're outcasts. Gypsy mother and children in front of covered wagon. Now, I want you to look carefully at the wheel of the wagon of the roulotte, the caravan, and how this wheel actually becomes the flat galette that was represented by Jacques Callot in the 16th century. The wheel becomes the hat indeed. Which you could maybe feel as wheel being a symbol of movement and traveling and being on the road as a divine, sacred way of living. In 1937, the Nazi sized 357 of Müller's works from German museums since the pictures were considered to be degenerate art. The Gypsy Holocaust the arrival of gypsies at Auschwitz and gypsies in the Belzec camp. As Hitler rose to power, the gypsies, like the Jews, were officially identified as non-Aryan by the Nuremberg Laws of 1935. Following this law, in 1936, an office was set up in Munich to specifically combat the gypsy Nuisance. Romani awaiting deportation in Asperg, Germany, 1940. Starved gypsy children in concentration camp. The Zygerners were considered to be a social and second class citizens, and regardless of whether they had been charged with any unlawful acts, they were herded into concentration camps. Nobody ever says anything about the Roma who were murdered, says 65-year-old Christina, a Polish Roma gypsy. She survived the massacre, several years in hiding, and then at the Plaszwa concentration camp in Krakow. In Plaszwa, there is a plaque remembering the Jews and the Polish people who died there, but it does not mention the Roma. Anniversary of the Zeigener Nacht, the night the Nazis liquidated the Roma camp in Auschwitz. For the commemorations, not many survivors turned up. Most are too old, too poor, and too far removed from the reality of this kind of event. Even. Monsieur Casimir Mirga, 73 years old, his entire family was exterminated. Anna Kari, a Holocaust survivor. The Gypsy and the Jew, two scapegoats. Their diasporic life disturbs. Diaspora, dispersion, moving, always in exile. And the representation of the Jew, the erring Jew, and the gypsies are the same, on the road with a stick to help walking, backpack. And it reminded me of the tarot cards, fortune telling, the number 22, which is the fool. And the fool is actually a mystical card that you can only attain enlightenment by moving, by traveling, by being on the road. Chagall painted the wandering Jew, same iconography as the tarot card, same iconography as the gypsy. The fool symbolizes the spirit in search of experience and the mystical cleverness birthed of reason within us.
the childlike ability to tune into the inner workings of the world, and the sun at his feet represents the divine nature of the fool's wisdom and exuberance, his holy madness or crazy wisdom, and the staff, wisdom through renunciation. There is an detachment from things, renouncing a world of material properties. It's very powerful. Here is the photo of an American-African woman protesting against the sterilization of Romani women. Czechoslovakia carried out a policy of sterilization of Romani women starting in 1973. The dissidents of the Charter 77 denounced it in 1977-78 as a genocide, but the practice continued through the Velvet Revolution of 1989. The glory of the Manouche, Jean Django Reinhardt. He was born in Belgium. He's the king of gypsy jazz. Django means I awake in Romani. He spent most of his youth in Romani encampments close to Paris and is famous for his swinging gypsy style nuage. Ba, 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 ba. Da, da, da. Here he is in 1946 playing for Roma people his people. During World War II, both Roma and jazz musicians were targeted by the yeah. Nazi regime. Over a million Roma were exterminated for presumed racial inferiority, and jazz was believed to combine the worst of black and Jews, i.e. musical race defilement. Just listening to a jazz record could get you sent to a concentration camp. Django Reinhardt, however, enjoyed quite a lucrative period of his career during the war, while living and playing openly among Nazi soldiers. The Germans used Paris basically as their rest and relaxation center. And when the soldiers came, they wanted wine, women, and song. And to many of them, jazz was the popular music. And Django was the most famous jazz musician in Paris. Django with Louis Armstrong and Duke Ellington in Paris. Reinhardt then survived because the Nazi loved his music and because he also enjoyed the protection of some individuals in the German occupation force. Gypsy guitar player Manitas de Plata, Little Silver Hands, and I met him. I, I, I saw him play in Sainte-Marie-de-la-Mer. It's, it's, it's an experience. He was born in a gypsy caravan in Sète, in southern France. He became famous by playing each year at the Sainte-Marie-de-la-Mer gypsy pilgrimage in Camargue, France. Manitas de Plata only agreed to play in public 10 years after the death of Django Reinhardt. Romani friends and the little girl dancing. Although illiterate, Manita's flamenco style guitar compositions and his magic fingers have enthralled the world. Salvador Dali and Jean Cocteau sponsored him and he played in the most famous concert halls. When you hear him play, it's as if three guitars are playing at the same time. Manitas de Plata became the favorite musician of the jet set of Saint-Tropez. And here he is with Brigitte Bardot. 
Picasso et Manitas de Plata et Mougin. Sainte Marie de la Mer is the gypsy from pilgrimage. A second century apocalyptic text tells of the three Marys, Magdalena, Jacobe, and Salome, along with Sarah the Egyptian, who in 33 of our common era discovered an empty tomb and rushed to announce the news of Christ's resurrection to the apostles. Sarai e Kali and Bengali Kali, destroyer of evil force, the Black Virgin and Kali, India, together again. La Camargue, an untamed coastal plain marked by soul marshes, wild horses, and wayside cowboy ranches. According to Provençal legend, in antiquity, this region of the Camargue was an island consecrated to the Egyptian god Ra, father of the sun. You see how everything is connected? And here are the Camargue horses live in semi-feral conditions in the marshy lands. And in Camargue, you find the flamingo. Flamenco, flamingo. And here they dance. Sainte Marie de la Mer immersion, which I link with the Varanesi Ganges immersion. You immerse yourself in the water, the Ganges in Varanesi in India, and Sainte Marie de la Mer in Camargue. They are in trance. After Django and Manitas de Plata, more recently, we've all danced on the Gypsy Kings. Great, great success. Reviving the fire within us. And then we reach something we, I call the mercantilization of the gypsy image. French soldiers picked up the brown tobacco cigarette in Spain. France began manufacturing les gitanes, gitanas, in 1842, often given names such as les Espagnols, the Spanish, les Hidalgos, et les Madrilènes. The gitan was born in 1910 and by 1927, the package had a flamenco hint with a fan and a tambourine. I smoke those very strong. The gypsy caravan, mercantilized, buy a caravan, become a gypsies. But if it doesn't come from the inside, you can have all the caravans of the world. You'll never be a vagabond, a traveler. Gypsy hosiery. Now, if you buy those medias, those uh, tights, you will become free like a gypsy, my foot. Hollywood stereotype. Oh, gypsy, the art of the tease, back to the cliché of the seductress. Cher, Johnny Depp, they are not gypsies, but they mercantilize the image. The 20th century has invented the bourgeois bohemian. We call it les bobos, or la gauche caviar, the caviar left wing. While he, she belongs to the upper or upper middle class in economic terms, his, her values are inherited from the countercultural movements of the 60s, open attitudes towards sexuality and recreational drugs, as well as support for liberal, progressive political causes. Sounds very much like the hippie. But the bobo is not a hippie. The bobo has a comfortable, beautiful flat in Paris or somewhere else. He's got food, he's got clothes, but his clothes have got to look exotic. And here is bobo de merde, uh, shitty bobos, and it says, 
Il ne se déplace qu'à vélo, mange bio et communie avec la nature en surfant tous les week-ends. He only uses a bicycle, he eats organic bio uh, food, which is uh, 10 times uh, more expensive than the other food, and he communicates with nature by surfing through the weekends. That's the bobo. The gypsy car by Maruti. So if you buy this uh, car, you're gonna have the gypsy spirit. The gypsy dancing lounge. The worst, the gypsy look. $10,000 a dress, high fashion by La Florene and Emilio Pucci. You buy this dress and you're gonna be gypsy? <laughs> It has to come from the inside. The gypsy Barbie dolls. Twenty-first century. Here is a Rome mother playing the accordion in Paris. I was born in Paris. I left a long time ago. And uh, I can always remember the street singers, the accordion, dancing in the street. I actually was part of them. I sat with them and I played an imaginary piano. Bah, 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 with them. It was magnificent. There are less and less now. A traditional horse carried caravan. A French Romani family in front of their caravan today. So it's not the roulotte made of wood and painted. It's a caravan. Modern. But they still travel, maybe. Here are Romanian Romani gypsies. The beautiful, aren't they? But also, in 2011, this advertisement for Halloween party still projecting the negative stealing tramping stigma. Gypsy, tramps and thieves. Today's situation in France. The same old story. This Displacement. Displacement. They have nowhere to go. Evacuation of a Romani camp. The gypsy way of life still leads to hostilities from the people of their host nations. Europeans regard private property as sacrosanct, whereas the Rome do not even have a word for owning, for property. That reminds me of Proudhon, who said property is theft. This gives rise to two incompatible ways of life and a continual problem of Roma being regarded as thieves from the European's view. Here is a Marseille encampment. And the bourgeois lady not even looking at the Romani. We are now witnessing, in France at least, I cannot talk about other countries, I didn't research it, a wish for sedentary life. Because they are put in encampments and they are left there with no sanitaries and uh, living in their modern caravans, and uh, they want their kids to go to school and they won't work, and says, nous voulons travailler, je veux rester à l'école, I want to go to school, I want work. And that was their way of life, that does not exist anymore. Why doesn't it exist anymore? There is not one inch on our planet that doesn't belong to somebody or some corporation. Everything has been bought. So if you cannot live in the forest anymore and uh, kill your rabbit uh, to eat, and, uh, they're trespassing, so they're put in jail or, or ghettos. There is no way for their way of life to continue. So to survive, they go for sedentarization. But the, the freeway to go wherever you want to go 
in the forests and it doesn't exist. I, I think the the last true nomads are in the desert, the Bedouins, because nobody wants to go and live there. And uh, they survive in the desert, they wash with the sand, they wash their, everything with the sand, you, they look at the stars, they move their encampment with camels, and, but nobody bothers them because nobody wants to live in the desert, but forests. Yeah, juxtaposition of the old way of the roulotte and the caravan uh, demonstration on the next expressway in, in France. Romani gypsies are recycling metal and plastic in the rubbish dump of Cluj in Romania. It could be anywhere in the favelas of uh, Brazil, but it could be here also. 20 kilometers away from San Miguel, mountains of our rubbish and people living there without a roof, without water, without sanitary. 20 kilometers of San Miguel. The Banjara nomadic tribe of Indian gypsies. Here they are. The word Banjara evolved from the Sanskrit Vanachara, which means forest wanderers, but there are no more forests. They are trespassing if they go in the forests. Here is the Cobra Gypsy of India. They are called the Cobra Gypsies of India, known as Kalbeliya, performing during the Pushkar Fair. The tambourine is there, they play their music, and they tame the Cobra. That's today. Yeah? There are some 15 million Roms dispersed across the world. Their history is one of suffering and misery, but it is also one of the victories of the human spirit over the blows of fate. Today, the Roms revive their culture and are looking for their identity. On the other hand, they integrate into the societies in which they live, if they are understood by their fellow citizens in their new homelands, their culture will enrich society's atmosphere. Indira Gandhi, with the wheel. The Indian wheel of salvation. the Indian flag and the Romani flag, the wheel. An Italian demonstration to protect the Romani people. So there is a force of resistance. The Romani Day celebration and dance in 2016. And I say thank you. Thank you with a heavy heart. We have so much to learn, relearn, recognize. I thank you very much.